Hi, I'm Eric Paulson, director of the Yale Chemical and Biophysical Instrumentation Center, and today I'm going to show you how to use our isothermal titration calorimeter, or ITC. In this case, we're just going to use water for both the cell and the syringe, so it's just going to be a water-water titration. But normally, in the experiment, you would have, for example, a macromolecule, such as a protein, uh, dissolved in the buffer in the cell, and then a small molecule to act as a ligand dissolved in the buffer in the syringe. And as the ligand is slowly titrated into the cell, you're monitoring the heat um, either given off or taken up, and that allows you to measure the, the binding response of the ligand to the protein. When you come to use the instrument, it should be logged into the ITC user account, which is the account that um, is used for uh, in between one user's run and the other to make sure that the instrument is just in a idle mode but is regulating the temperature. So first thing you should do is close the ITC run window, log out, and log in with your own account. Use your NetID and your NetID password. After you log in, you're going to launch the ITC run program. It will come up with a uh, window telling you that the instrument needs to have the burette be home reset. So click the OK button and it will give you instructions about how to allow the home reset procedure to occur. So step one, remove the burette handle from the instrument. That refers to this part right here. This is the burette and this burette handle. To remove it, you need to push it down with some force and rotate it so that it unlocks and then you can pull out the burette handle. Step two is telling you if the syringe was installed, which would be like this, then you should remove it, set it aside. Step three is to reinstall the burette handle. To reinstall the burette handle, you need to make sure that the gauge is a fa facing approximately toward the front. It should not be toward the back or the side. There are three little notches that engage three pins. So the pins need to engage in the notch and then you push it down and it will lock in this part of the notch. So I'm turning it here until it engages. I'm pushing it down and now it's locked. Then we can press the OK button and the program will launch. It will say that it is home resetting. So you can see the plunger here, it moves all the way down to the bottom and then back up to the top during the home reset procedure. This is so that the instrument can ensure that the plunger is in a known location when you start to set up your experiment. When the home reset is finished, it will say that the status is idle and now the instrument is ready for you to start setting it up. So to clean the cell, we're gonna go back and remove the burette again. There's a number of ways that you can clean the cell. If the cell is already relatively clean, you can use a half mil syringe like this with a long needle and you can suck up some solution. It could be a cleaning solution or it could be water or buffered. And then you're going to put the syringe down into the cell and then you can insert the solution and remove it again. Typically, you're going to want to flush the cell multiple times with the syringe. If you're using detergent or if you just want to be sure that the, uh, um, the cell is, has thoroughly been rinsed and cleaned, you can use this uh, vacuum apparatus here. Um, this attaches to the degassing station and pulls a vacuum um, through this bottle that will collect any waste liquid through this device which goes down into the syringe and then it will suck up any solution um, from this tube here. So the way you would use that is you would put this down into the cell and making sure that this part is engaged on the, on the cone once it's installed. Put this end into whatever you want to flush through the cell such as water or buffer or a uh, detergent solution. 
use the degassing station, press the button that says clean. It will turn on the vacuum pump. We'll start to suck up the solution through the cleaning wand and then the liquid will uh, come out in, in this container here. You can turn off the vacuum by pressing the clean button again. Typically it will keep pulling liquid through because there's a considerable vacuum in this volume here. So it's often easiest just to remove the tube and it will suck air through to finish uh, releasing the vacuum. So now we've removed the cleaning wand. The next step will be to flush the cell with the buffer that you're using for your experiment. It's very important for every part of the system to be equilibrated and flushed with the same buffer. So that includes the cell and the syringe because what you want is for the only difference between the cell and the syringe to be whatever material you're titrating in to the cell from the syringe. So this needs to be flushed and filled with exactly the same buffer as the cell has been flushed and, and filled with. In this case, I'm going to one more time flush the cell with water. It's okay to put the needle all the way down to the bottom and let it hit the bottom. It will actually pull a little bit of a vacuum at the very bottom. This helps you make sure that you've sucked out the last, every last little bit of liquid from the cell when you're flushing it. As I mentioned, it's important for the syringe as well as the cell to be filled that's free of bubbles. And this degassing station can help you achieve that. It's most critical typically in cases where you're running at temperatures uh, different from room temperature. To use the degassing station, you would put your samples into these wells here. So you can put small Eppendorfs into the side wells. And if you want to put a larger tube, you can put that into the center well. If you're running at a temperature different than room temperature, on the menu, you can set the temperature. Currently, we're going to just run at 25 degrees. To degas, what you want to do is to turn on the vacuum. That will start pulling a vacuum under this little bell jar here. And now I'm going to load it with, with the uh, liquid to put in the cell. As I said, normally it would be a buffer with your macromolecule in it. In this case, it's just going to be water. The volume of the cell is 190 microliters, but the recommended amount to fill the cell with is 300 microliters. This ensures that the top of the liquid is up in the stem above the cell so that as liquid is titrated into the cell it does not affect the the temperature of the cell because the change in liquid height will be far away from the cell itself. In some cases it's possible to use a smaller volume of liquid. Um, I would recommend uh, discussing uh, these sorts of questions with an applications expert at TA Instruments. Um, there is a uh, uh, contact information here on the side of the instrument where you can uh, email or call to uh, ask questions such as uh, um, concentrations of materials and uh, um, any more advanced procedures. Now we need to fill the syringe and as I mentioned before normally the syringe would be filled with buffer that contains your ligand. The syringe holds 50 microliters of liquid and this is uh, perhaps the most tricky part of the whole procedure in setting up the instrument. So the goal is to have the syringe filled all the way from the bottom of the needle up to the 50 microliter mark here full of liquid without any bubbles and with a small cushion of air between the top of the plunger and the top of the liquid. Um, there are several ways that this can be done. One way that uh, is possible to do this is to use a pipette and fill the, the syringe from the top. I'm not going to be discussing that. Um, an alternative way is to use the syringe itself and suck up liquid, liquid 
and then use gravity to help assist filling the, the rest of the syringe. And I'll demonstrate that, that technique. What you will see is the solution is drawn up, but there's quite a large gap between the top of the liquid and the plunger. So we need to remove, reduce that gap. We want the gap to only be about one millimeter in size. To do that, what we want to do is pull the plunger completely out of the syringe and then allow gravity. You may need to tap the, the syringe a little bit and eventually the, uh, oop, there we go. You can get the uh, liquid to flow all the way down to the bottom. If it, uh, if it flows out, typically surface tension will hold it in place and then you can tip it back. And what you want is to insert the, the, the plunger of the syringe so that there's about a one to two millimeter gap between the top of the liquid and the tip of the plunger. This gap um, acts as a sort of shock absorber so that the uh, solution is ejected smoothly as it steps from one titration step to the next. So it's important to have that gap in there. You don't want the plunger touching the top of the, the syringe. Now, the liquid is now filled from the plunger down to some point here, but now there's air in the bottom part of the syringe. So now that we've set the top part, what we need to do is go back and push the plunger down until liquid starts coming out of the bottom of the, of the syringe. And then we can put the syringe back into the solution and draw it up typically to the 50 microliter mark on the top here. And now the syringe is completely full from top to bottom. It's very important for the syringe to be in good shape with the needle straight, no mechanical problems, with a uh, tight seal between the tip of the plunger and the interior of the syringe. We do have a syringe that we allow users in the CBIC to use with no, no charge. However, um, be aware that this syringe is potentially used by anybody using the instrument. Just need to insert it into the burette handle and screw it in. The, this part of the burette handle turns, so you may need to hold that in position as you screw it in, otherwise it won't screw into place. And you don't need to screw it in super tight, just up against the, the top of the plastic here and now we're going to install it back into the instrument. So being careful to keep everything aligned uh, vertically so that we don't um, uh, damage or bend the, the needle, we're going to insert it into the, into the instrument of the uh, housing here. So now we're inserting it back down. And as before, we want to rotate this until it engages the notches on the pins, the um, marking should be toward the front of the instrument. Push it down with uh, some amount of force, um, not excessive, but a uh, significant amount of force. It pushes down the springs, then you turn it and it should lock in place. In the software, first thing I would typically recommend doing is to start the syringe stirring. For our instrument, typically somewhere between uh, 250 and 300 RPMs is a reasonable uh, stirring rate. Certain experiments may require a different stirring rate. Just type in the number here and then click start and you should hear the, the syringe start stirring. During this, uh, this equilibration period, it's a good idea to set up the titration protocol for our experiment. This table here lists the number of injections, the time between each injection in seconds, and the volume to be injected. The table can be edited by hand if you wish. It will adjust the number to match the resolution of the instrument. So if it's slightly different than what you type in, that's the reason. Alternately, you could click delete to delete all the entries and then click insert and it would allow you to um, specify a number of injections, the volume and the interval. 
So um, let's, for example, let's go for 180 seconds with an injection volume of uh, 2.5 microliters and a total number of injections of 20. That will fill out the table. In many cases, the first injection will have a large error, so it can be uh, a good idea to reduce the volume of the first injection. Talking to the applications hotline uh, can help provide advice with this if you don't know. The instrument is already starting to equilibrate, but we can use this auto equilibrate um, option down here to help ensure that the uh, um, instrument has fully equilibrated in terms of uh, temperature stability before starting the experiment. Uh, the three options here for expected heat, small, medium, and large, basically uh, set how much error is acceptable before starting the experiment. The smallest option will wait for the baseline to be the most stable before starting the experiment, whereas the largest option will allow the baseline to be somewhat unstable before starting the experiment. Um, you may want this option if you don't want to wait as long before starting the experiment. We'll show you the small option, for example. So now everything is ready. We can start the experiment by clicking on the green triangle here that says start experiment. It will prompt you for a name of a file if you haven't entered one already. At this point, it will start collecting data points for the auto equilibration. Uh, equilibration can take anywhere from five minutes to tens of minutes, depending on how stable the instrument already is and how stable you need the baseline to be. We can see the, the baseline uh, over time on the monitor tab. Okay, now it has collected enough statistics that the auto equilibration procedure has actually started. Um, what you see on here, either printed on the top of the graph or shown graphically on the graph itself, are the current slope of the baseline and the current standard deviation of the baseline, as well as the acceptable slope based on the amount of heat that you expect and the acceptable, acceptable standard deviation, again, based on the amount of heat that you expect. So we can certainly currently see that the, the current slope is much, much larger than the acceptable slope, likewise with the standard deviation. If at any point you want to override the auto equilibration, you can always do so by clicking on the start data collection immediately. Otherwise, you can just wait for the auto equilibration to proceed normally, and when the baseline's actual observed slope and deviation become within the acceptable ranges, the experiment will automatically start. If we zoom in, we can see now that the, the gray line has almost reached the blue line in terms of the acceptable standard deviation. We're going to, in this case, say that it's close enough, so now we can go to start data collection immediately. At this point, it will now start collecting the initial baseline. So this is after the auto equilibration is going to collect another period of time, which will be the starting baseline for your data set. At this point on the data tab, you can see the actual baseline data that's being collected. It seems that our first injection had a bit of an anomaly. There may have been an air bubble or something, but uh, um, anyway, the data is starting to uh, collect and I'm going to pull up an older data set um, that was run previously. To do that, we're going to start the program Nano Analyze. And we're going to open a data set. And the raw data is the NITC data. So I will open 
the data set. And we can pull up the curve of what we might typically expect during a water water titration. So what we see here is a dip associated with each injection. We also see that the baseline is not perfectly stable and the program has uh, set these control points in an effort to smooth out the baseline. For information on analyzing and interpreting ITC data, uh, watch for another video or read the user guide. If you wish to stop the data collection early, you can click the Stop Experiment button here. And it will ask you if you want to stop stirring or not. If I choose no, it will stop the data collection but continue to stir. And if at some point, such as now, we wish to stop the stirring, we can click on the Stop Stirring button here. When you're finished with your experiment, please be sure to remove the syringe from the burette. Thoroughly clean and dry the syringe, as well as clean and dry the cell. Leave the cell um, filled with air only, so that it does not cause problems for the next user. When the cell is clean and dry, you can reinstall the burette handle with no syringe installed. Then you will want to exit the ITC run program log out of your account, log on with the username and password shown in front of the instrument, restart the ITC run program and leave it running. Um, this will allow the instrument to continue equilibrating so that it, the temperature will be more stable and equilibrated for the next user. If you don't leave the program running, it will not be actively equilibrating and regulating the temperature and it will take significantly longer to achieve a stable baseline for the next user.